few colleagues. Um, as a way you see that I'm sitting, I hope I can communicate to you that I imagine these kinds of events as an informal, more informal way of coming together to discuss selected papers and presentations in a late afternoon hour. Today, it's uh, my privilege and my pleasure to introduce to you Tamar Osma from Hungary. Tamar is our, one of our associate research fellows, a new program about which I'm going to tell a little bit more in a minute. He has been receiving his MA in International Relations from Corvinus University in Budapest and is currently affiliated with the Knowledge Center in Budapest as well as with the University of Pech, where he's a PhD candidate. His actual, actual area of, of expertise and his focus in his PhD is energy politics in Turkey. Today we're going to listen to a slightly different topic, as you can see already, it's about Turkmen gas and particularly energy supplies to Europe, the perceptions in Europe. I don't know if you were able to follow news about Turkmen gas or let's say energy politics in the wider Central Asian region. I believe you have heard about the, the agreement the five literal states of the Caspian Sea received or managed to, to conclude after many, many years of discussion. So there's currently again an, an, an upsurge in discussions and, and ideas and hopes for particular energy resources to be channeled in some ways to Europe and Europe has this discussion going on already, I don't know for how long. I hope Tamash is going to shed a little bit light on these issues. The Associate Research Fellowship, fellowship as a last note, is a spontaneous idea we had a little bit more than a year ago to see if the Academy can serve actually also like a host-based hub for researchers in the region and from abroad to use our network and a little bit our resources and if possible also our affiliation to come here, conduct research, most often of course dedicated to Central Asia and therefore give us an opportunity also to benefit from this input. Tamás said he's going to talk about for 30 minutes I think then we have an open 30 minutes for questions and answers and um, then we see where we take it from there. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. So, thank you very much, Alexander, for, uh, for the kind introduction. So, uh, I would like to extend my uh, greetings to you, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your time uh, you invested in uh, listening to me at this um, presentation. Uh, well, as the uh, director uh, mentioned, my uh, closer research topic or my, my dissertation topic uh, is energy politics in Turkey. And when it comes to talk about Turkey, uh, we have to see that it's not only about Turkey, but it's about uh, the surrounding of Turkey, because Turkey is mostly connecting uh, the energy-rich regions with energy-hunger regions. Uh, of course, Turkey uh, has the intention to improve it as an as energy hub, but uh, energy hub perception cannot work without having the proper uh, amount of energy for becoming a hub. So, therefore, uh, Turkmenistan can be assessed uh, in this context because uh, Turkmenistan is, uh, is a Central Asian country that is supposed to have. Uh, potential energy leaks uh, via the Caspian Sea to the so-called Southern Energy Corridor, which is the flagship initiative of the European Union's uh, energy diversification projects. And a couple of uh, sentences I would like to say as uh, an so introduction to so why this topic is relevant, why, why to discuss this. Uh, relate, uh, Events related to the progress of the Southern Gas Corridor uh, has been quite fast in, in the past couple of years, but beforehand it was just very much, uh, very much waiting for something to happen. Now it seems that uh, there are several events that uh, that can give a new that can uh, give a new perspective about speaking of uh, the Turkmen gases 
connectivity, potential connectivity to Europe. So these issues have been long discussed in the <coughs> European Union's energy security uh, discourse, and uh, approximately, like more, we are speaking about more more than a 20 years period. So in 1996, the potential construction of the Trans-Caspian gas pipe was gas pipeline was raised by the United States and uh, by a number of European countries that time. Uh, but, of course, this project was not realized at that time. And since more than two decades um, uh, passed since then, and a number of very important developments in this regard took place, now it's, it's time to take a stock of what has been achieved, and where are we now, and what are the future uh, perspectives. Uh, when it comes to talk about uh, European Union's connectivity to Central Asia, uh, we can see that the, 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 purpose, the purpose is there uh, from the European side, uh, but if you see the dynamics, even though the purpose is there, not that much happened uh, to practical reasons. But for instance, we have seen Turkmenistan's energy connectivity or energy connectedness to China, we can see that it has been, uh, it has been progressing quite rapidly. So the dynamics and, and the pace how, uh, how Turkmenistan can get connected uh, to new potential export directions is varying very much uh, from region to region. And as I mentioned in my very first sent sentences that Turkey is in the middle, I have to say that when talking about uh, Turkmenistan, it is necessary to speak about all the countries that might be affected when it comes to the inclusion of two natural gas uh, to potentially uh, to the European uh, to the European energy security networks. So we have to see what's going on in China, what's going what's going on uh, in Azerbaijan, what's going on in Iran, uh, Turkey, uh, Russia, but also within uh, within Europe. The Russia-Ukraine uh, relationship is very uh, interesting uh, in this regard. So most probably it is the best if we look at, uh, look at all these countries as a whole, uh, but we cannot say that a zero-sum game is uh, happening because there might be energy relations boosting to one direction and maybe to another direction it's, they are fading away. Uh, so when it comes to speak about energy resources, it's quite important that we are not talking about simply the commodities, they are very much connected to foreign policy and uh, the pipelines which are very central point of view in uh, connecting Turkmenistan uh, to the uh, outer world in terms or above uh, the existing export channels. It's uh, very much important to see the plurality of approaches that we can apply. So one apply generally, uh, one can apply the geopolitical approach. It says uh, practically what is what are the geographical uh, repercussions or what are the geographical uh, context of uh, certain steps in energy policy. But the other is more like economic or commercial. We can see an example, for instance, when it comes to SS, uh, a European project. Uh, between Russia and Germany, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is from, uh, which is assessed uh, either in the geopolitical aspect or the commercial uh, economic aspect. Also, when, when I say it in my title that researching uh, Central Asia from an EU perspective, or researching this uh, topic from an EU perspective, it may be, I have to uh, underline that it's not easy to say that what is an EU perspective because of course the individual European Union member states have uh, different visions but there is a very strong overall uh, European energy security discourse coming from Brussels uh, and this one has uh, and uh, Turkmenistan plays an important role in this uh, so it's to, to do research on this topic, uh, it's very important to have dialogue, so I will be also in the discussion part, I will be very happy uh, to hear about your opinion, how do you see this topic, uh, because there might be 
uh, I, I might be uh, receiving very interesting uh, ideas for further research as well. So practically, uh, my presentation is based on uh, three main objectives. So firstly, uh, to shed light on the, on the basic elements of the EU discourse, uh, and I will refer uh, to the context of how Turkmenistan uh, can be assessed uh, in this context, and to, I will highlight a number of natural gas related uh, developments in uh, Turkmenistan that took place in the past couple of years, and they are important uh, when it comes to assess uh, assess uh, the chances of, of a potential Transcaspian uh, pipeline, for instance. And also, uh, the third point, or the third objective, comes from the second one. It's about the exact chances of the gas connectivity, direct gas links between the EU and Turkmenistan. Uh, well, just to give um, broader context about the EU narrative on energy security, uh, Maros Jelcevic, uh, the Vice President for the EU's uh, uh, Vice President for, for the Energy uh, Union of the European Commission, said what we, will, what we do now will clearly decide the place of Europe on the geopolitical map of this century. And uh, he said it in an interview uh, referring to the Energy Union and what uh, the European perspective uh, is on energy cooperation and on the functioning of the internal energy market and about the interconnection of energy networks. Uh, also another quotation about, just to, uh, to broaden the scope of this discourse, it's about uh, Miguel Arias uh, Cañete, uh, he's the Energy Commissioner of the European Commission, and, and he highlights uh, that Europe is still heavily dependent on fossil fuels. So when it comes to assess uh, a country's uh, potential energy relations to the EU, it's a very major point that still today, even, uh, even if there are very, uh, uh, like very intensive uh, work on moving towards green energy and uh, diversification of sources, used, still uh, in this decade, uh, fossil fuels are inevitable uh, in the European Union. And we can see uh, several figures about the energy import dependency of the European Union. You can see here that uh, the European Union's, when speaking especially about natural gas, this is, this is the focus of uh, this presentation and also my research, uh, we can see that in the past uh, bit more than 20 years, uh, energy dependency has been increasing to a level of uh, 70% uh, in the European Union, which is a quite, uh, which is a quite uh, substantial amount. So it also, yeah, we can see practically uh, the same for the natural gas highlighted, that in 2016 uh, it accessed, uh, I mean it exceeded uh, 70%, uh, which is 60% growth, more than 60% growth. <coughs> compared to the base of 1995. And we can see what are the main origins of uh, primary energy imports of the EU28. Uh, Russia has a prominent role in this, and Norway and Algeria are also very relevant actors. But when it comes to Europe's diversification attempts, or Europe's uh, sub energy supply diversification objectives, very much comes to uh, view it in the context about uh, shifting the way from this large uh, dependency on the gas coming from Russia. We can see uh, the energy dependency rates uh, for, uh, for the individual countries of the European Union. Uh, we can see that some countries uh, were net exporters of energy back in, uh, back in the millennium. But since then, practically everyone turned into the uh, net uh, importers of energy in the European Union. So I would like to just very briefly uh, shed light on the fact that when it comes to EU energy policy, this is not an exclusive competence of, uh, 
uh, of the European uh, Union. Uh, this is this is a shared com this belongs energy issues belong to the shared competence of the European Union because the Union has uh, exclusive competence only in these five areas uh, which are mentioned on the slide. And I would like to also uh, draw attention to central aspects of the EU energy policy uh, and what were what were uh, very major. Uh, triggers for uh, changes in the energy policy of the European Union, or what are the factors driving it in the past couple of years. It's important to mention um, how countries relate to, uh, to nuclear energy. And uh, after the Fukushima uh, event of uh, 2011, Germany was, for instance, um, Germany introduced very significant steps <coughs> in. Um, in taking steps back from the nuclear energy, uh, which created, of course, the need for uh, moving towards, uh, for instance, natural gas or renewable energies. Uh, also, we have to see that not only oil, but I mean, not only the natural gas, but also oil and other solid fuels are highly uh, dependent on imports in the European uh, Union. And now the total EU gas demand is approximately. Uh, 480 billion cubic meter per year, and uh, well, as, as has been said, Russia approximately covers the 40% uh, of all over imports. So coming down from that first, not not from the 480, but from the 70% of uh, 480. And we have to see that in the European Union, the indigenous production declines, uh, and still there is a. Uh, there is a need for energy, so therefore natural gas is is a good natural gas is a good deal because it's a relatively uh, clean source of energy. It's fossil, but it's it's much cleaner than other energy sources. So natural gas is uh, is about to play continue to play a very important role in the future, and also it's a highly politicized com commodity. I will uh, give some details on this on the, in later. And we have to see that from the European Union side, uh, there is a lot of policy output uh, aiming at creating uh, a greater coordination in, in energy issues. And in the past 10 years, number of uh, plans and roadmaps and strategies have been uh, have been uh, started in order to create in order to create. Um, in order to create greater energy security uh, in Europe with more sustainable uh, energy and more competitive energy. And the most important buzzwords in this regard, these are security, solidarity and trust. These are key elements of uh, the European Energy Union, which was introduced in, in February of 2015, uh, which, has, uh, which has a couple of aims. Uh, mostly functioning, mostly related to the, to the uh, desired functioning of the internal energy market and, and energy security uh, in the European Union. Also, just one more, uh, what Marushevich said uh, at the inauguration ceremony of Tanak Pipeline, which I mentioned, or which I characterized as one of the flagship initiatives, the Southern Gas Corridors, Main uh, main uh, string of gas pipeline is approximately 2,000 kilometer long, uh, crossing through Turkey, and uh, basically he said uh, uh, that the EU's energy interests do not stop uh, at the EU's borders, and uh, it has a strong external dimension. And therefore, in this context, it's important that we pay enough attention uh, to the eastern uh, direction where Turkmenistan is. So when it comes to the often mentioned diversification, how to do that? Well, first we have to say that Russia has a very, uh, very so the infrastructure between Russia and the European uh, Union countries uh, date back to a long time, and this is a long, long time practice uh, to buy Russian gas in the EU member states. Of course, in theory, there are many uh, ways for uh, possible diversification 
It could be by the route, it could be by the source country, it could be uh, by the contract, uh, by changing the contractual frameworks of, uh, of buying energy. But there are other factors that need to be considered. For instance, commercial factors, geopolitical factors, legal factors. And uh, well, as I mentioned, the EU energy policy is a shared competence, so that doesn't mean that countries have very uh, uh, countries have differing visions sometimes and differing interests in certain projects. Inclusive of the North Stream 2, we will enable uh, another 55 billion cubic meters uh, natural gas available uh, for the European markets. It will be uh, transported through the uh, through the pipeline uh, under uh, or on the seabed of the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany, and this pipeline is an important, uh, it's, it's, it's not only a new uh, possible way of uh, transporting energy, but it can redraw the energy map, for instance in the case of Ukraine, because uh, the Russian Federation is interested in, uh, re uh, in revising export channels, and given the fact that between Russia and Ukraine there was uh, several times these gas prices uh, based on payment disputes, and Russia considers Ukraine as a problematic transit country, which means that Russia uh, is uh, planning to uh, propose pipelines that are avoiding the territory of Ukraine. And another uh, one would be the Turk Stream connecting Russia to Turkey, uh, which is also uh, an important uh, current project uh, being under construction at the very moment. And when it comes to LNG, yes, to some if, if energy can be a solution to the European Union, I would say not. It could be a partial solution, but I have to highlight that Western Europe has unused LNG capacity. LNG is not necessarily uh, cheaper than gas provided by Russia, for instance, or provided by other sources. Uh, and of course, not all the countries uh, have the access to the sea, uh, which is when it comes to uh, the transportation of LNG-based uh, gas from, from a seaport to another spot, it's again cost, cost and cost, which makes it uh, commercially uh, non-viable. So for some countries, for, for instance in the case of Poland, uh, Poland is raising the amount of, uh, of uh, gas purchased from Qatar, uh, which is the largest LNG provider of the world. But also in the European discourse, there is uh, Eastern Mediterranean gas. One can follow the events in uh, the Cyprus, uh, also Israeli gas, the Egyptian gas. These are all very dynamically uh, going on, but still a question if it will be uh, rooted to Europe, but it's very much part of the discourse, as, uh, such as uh, the Caspian Sea basin gas, which is uh, at the very moment looks like that. Uh, Azerbaijani gas from the Shakhtar Ispiel will reach the European Union in uh, approximately 2020. Uh, but still, many questions uh, apply to this project. Yes, uh, well, about the connectivity in terms of energy between the Caspian Sea region and Central Asia and the European Union, uh, we can see that. Uh, in the, in the big geopolitical context, the first very important steps uh, in the regard that energy transportation links are built, were built uh, without the participation of Russia, that was, uh, that was the, the Baku to the uh, uh, oil pipeline built, uh, commissioned in 2006. And just a bit later, the, the Baku to the uh, gas pipeline, which were actually quite new in that sense that from Russia's strategic backyard uh, these pipelines uh, provided uh, energy sources uh, to, to the world market or to other countries without crossing Russia. So this is something new uh, back then. And also there are these pipelines very much discussed in the past 10 years like Nabucco and South Stream Buffer cancelled. Now some sort of new versions of these pipelines uh, are being uh, in construction in the Southern Gas Corridor, 
which will link Azerbaijan to Italy via three uh, segments of this whole pipeline. And also Central Asia, which especially Turkmenistan, which has very significant uh, energy resources. It's a question if Turkmenistan will be able to join this. I also have to highlight that there is, in the past 20-25 years, a strong policy dialogue between uh, the Central Asian countries and the European Union uh, with regard to energy cooperation and a number of technical assistance programs and coordination mechanisms have been drawn up uh, in order to, in order to uh, find solutions or, or to, to prepare a welcoming background for uh, a pipeline that could finally link Turkmenistan uh, to the energy uh, transportation corridors reaching out from Azerbaijan uh, towards Europe. And uh, in the past couple of years, so back in 2011, these uh, negotiations between EU and Turkmenistan uh, has been renewed. And back in 2015, the Ashgabat Declaration was quite, uh, quite uh, straightforwardly uh, confirming that the parties want to uh, move on with the construction of the pipeline uh, from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan. And uh, this could be the materialization of, uh, of uh, connecting Turkmen to Europe. Uh, this is this is basically the, the channel what we are talking about. And when it comes to uh, just <coughs> just some outlooks about the global use of pipelines and energy. When it comes to discuss Turkmenistan or Central Asia, we are talking about landlocked countries, so whatever uh, the global LNG trends might be, we are growing, so the proportion of uh, LNG is slowly but growing according to the given statistics, but uh, still in this region pipelines will be, uh, pipelines will remain the most important or, or uh, the most relevant sources of uh, energy transportation. And also, uh, I will give you details about uh, Turkmenistan's current export uh, uh, landscape. There are several pipelines, and, and some of them are uh, some of them are under construction, or uh, we have not so full information is not uh, disclosed about them. But we have to see that about two percent is the fourth largest uh, proven gas reserves in the world, in, uh, and the eleventh largest producer, and once it, it was uh, the seventh largest exporter of natural gas to the world. The EU could be, in, pre in theory, it could be uh, a very ideal market for Turkmen gas because uh, the export. Uh, the diversification needs of Turkmenistan could meet with Europe's uh, import diversification needs. And there is a memorandum of understanding also uh, between the EU and Turkmenistan. Uh, and we have to see that for Turkmenistan it's very vital. Uh, natural gas is a very vital source of uh, income to the country. It, it's sharing the GDP. It's it's, I do not have the latest figures, but it's a very, subs uh, very substantial amount. But we have to see that it means it is a big pressure for Turkmenistan that uh, we are still in the era of low gas prices, which means that uh, the, the income in foreign currency is, uh, is not that high at the moment than, uh, as it uh, used to be. And uh, we have to see that Turkmenistan uh, has been once, uh, or for, not for once, but for decades, has been supplying Russia with very substantial amounts of natural gas. And it has been increased to the zero level uh, by January of 2016. Russia and Turkmenistan uh, have been, uh, well, this energy relationship uh, has been uh, going downhill because of. Um, because of the fact that uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Russia uh, wanted to revisit uh, the pricing policy of uh, how uh, Turkmen gas, uh, at what price Turkmen gas is bought uh, by Russia, 
and this led to uh, to discontent among the uh, among the parties, and finally uh, Russia uh, doesn't import anymore uh, Turkmen gas, except for the very fact that just in last October it has been floated that Russia might resume uh, the import of Turkmen gas. Also, we have to see, see that very similar thing happened uh, towards Iran. Uh, Iran once uh, has been uh, importing Turkmen gas, but uh, it stopped in 2017, and now Iran is only assisting with uh, some swap deals between uh, Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan. That Turkmenistan releases uh, some gas to Iran, and Iran is uh, releasing some gas. Uh, to uh, the, the same amount to Azerbaijan, but these are not uh, that big amount. And also, there are uh, there is there is the Tapi project. You might uh, heard, heard about that. Uh, that's the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India pipeline, uh, which is some parts of it are under construction, but this is a very uh, long-standing uh, project dating back to 2002 and uh, well you can see that in the, seven, in the past 17 years not much has happened this, is, uh, this project is facing uh, security issues but also financing issues and uh, a number of other issues uh, according to media reports uh, several, at several points uh, the pipeline is already under construction but probably in the past four or five years, uh, one should not expect that uh, this one will be ready and, uh, and uh, transporting gas to, uh, towards India. And very important to speak about also, when it comes to assess the European point of view of the Caspian natural gas, it's worth have uh, a look on the figures comparing Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan. Azerbaijan uh, has reached progress in partnering with the European Union and uh, Turkmenistan is, is near, I mean geographically near, only a 300 km pipeline is uh, missing. Of course, in other, uh, several, several other reasons I will just mention uh, afterwards. But to see that uh, the situation of Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan is uh, very different also in terms of the proven reserves, uh, about, uh, also about production and uh, the export uh, capacities of natural gas. And uh, Turkmenistan's export uh, figures, if we can see, uh, they are just multiple uh, times uh, the export capacities of uh, Azerbaijan. Just uh, to show you the export directions, very major one, of course, is uh, to China. Just a couple of sentences uh, on the Chinese direction. Uh, Turkmenistan has been uh, supplying natural gas to China uh, since end of 2009, beginning of 2010. And Turkmenistan was expected to uh, increase uh, the amount of natural gas, the volume of natural gas to 65 billion cubic meters per year by uh, 2020, most probably this is not going to happen as some it lies uh, at the moment the amount uh, approximately at 30 uh, something this year per year. Also another important project or an important question if uh, the so-called line B will be built that could release an extra amount of uh, natural gas to China. It's important to highlight that Turkmenistan is uh, indebted to China also. So China appeared as, a, as an investor to the Turkmen energy sector and, and uh, Turkmenistan is depending on the Chinese market at the moment given that it cannot uh, export the gas towards Iran nor can it uh, transport towards Russia so now the only one major export route is uh, to China. So it's something similar situation when it comes to being dependent on one single uh, uh, buyer. This very much applies to Turkmenistan at the very moment. 
However, uh, when it comes to the connectivity to the energy networks probably reaching Europe in the future, we have to see that the missing link, the Trans-Caspian pipeline, uh, can be viewed slightly from a different perspective nowadays because there has been a number of positive uh, factors and there are positive developments which might raise the chance of this project. Uh, once is that uh, the East-West pipeline uh, has been, uh, the, the construction of the East-West pipeline has been concluded in uh, Turkmenistan in December 2015. This would uh, enable to the transportation of uh, Turkmen natural gas from the east, the southeast of the country, uh, from the, the Galkinish uh, gas field to the western port of the country, which would be a precondition, uh, for instance, to uh, supply it into a future pipeline. Also, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan uh, progress their energy cooperation. Uh, it's important in this regard, the Southern Gas Corridor is progressing, the Tanak Pipeline has been uh, inaugurated and uh, its continuation, the TAP, the trans adrian Pipeline is currently under construction. And uh, what Alexander mentioned in, in uh, his introduction, that the, August, the 12th of August summit in Octo about uh, the Convention on the Legal Status of the Caspian Sea, has basically resulted in a more favorable environment uh, for a trans caspian project. And uh, this, this is basically based on the fact that uh, the, I think it's the 14th article of the document that uh, stipulates that uh, only the two, uh, so when it comes to laying uh, undersea pipelines, uh, the consent only is needed from the participating countries or those who are party to the, uh, to the potential pipeline. So in this case, it uh, means that only Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan should agree uh, on this uh, project. But this is only from a legal point of view. Also, there are a number of political obstacles. As it used to be in the past, Russia and Iran was uh, opposing uh, such uh, project. Partly for geopolitical reasons, but uh, more openly opposed uh, to the environmental uh, concerns re related to the project. But, when it, but it's also very important to highlight that the commercial viability uh, is, is even more relevant when it comes to the financing of a potential pipeline, when it comes to the availability of the gas, uh, when it comes to who will be the customers, what will be the price of that? Is it a competitive price compared uh, to, for instance, Russian gas or from, from compared to Azerbaijani uh, natural gas? And also, it's a question uh, if Russia will, uh, in fact, uh, resume uh, some imports of Turkmen gas, then Turkmenistan might not be interested uh, in uh, constructing this pipeline. But I have to remind that all other factors or all other uh, questions need to be taken into consideration. Of course, when it comes to connecting uh, the two sides or the, or the two shores of the Caspian Sea, there has been discussed a lot of issues like technical solutions and that energy, which I have to uh, say that it's a very expensive solution, or to link just uh, the offshore gas fields of Turkmenistan under the sea to the uh, undersea uh, pipelines in Azerbaijan or, or to the Azeri fields. Uh, so there has been discussed many ways how to connect uh, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan. But uh, these are these seem to be uh, not very feasible at the moment. And there are a number of future questions that we need to assess when it comes to uh, assessing uh, the European view on uh, Turkmen natural gas. First, the question is, does the European Union really need natural gas? Uh, there is practically enough source of natural gas around uh, the European Union, and it has multiple options uh, to import. The Turkmen gas should be very competitive in a way that it would uh, have enough demand uh, to buy it. 
Also, it's important to mention, if we see that this project is not that realistic at the moment, but might be realistic later, we have to uh, see that uh, in the era of decarbonization, the European Union will try uh, to gradually decrease uh, the amount of natural gas and to move towards uh, more renewable energies. So, therefore, it is a question whether an extra amount will be needed. Another very important uh, segment of the question is that uh, Turkmenistan, what, what, is, uh, what are the export policies and investment policies of uh, Turkmenistan? Turkmenistan is uh, certainly in need of foreign investments uh, for establishing such a project. Uh, such as uh, the Trans-Caspian pipeline, and it is very challenging. <coughs> so between the European, so the initially between the EU and Turkmenistan, uh, it was the not the consent, but it was the attempt to reach that 30 million BCM per year of Turkmen gas, which is available in Turkmenistan, would be uh, transported to Europe. This is a quite huge amount, and you have to see that. And uh, in Europe, there is not necessarily the demand for this. Also, the price is another question. And a very technical and commercial question is that the, the energy companies would be interested to invest in Turkmenistan once the investment climate would be more uh, welcoming, and they would be investment companies would be interested in signing uh, production sharing agreements with Turkmenistan as Turkmenistan does with China, for instance. Because if the production sharing agreement is, shared, uh, is uh, signed between energy companies and uh, the Turkmen state company, then it could mean a guarantee to, uh, to both parties that the project will happen and uh, the agreed amount of gas will be uh, transported uh, in fact. So this, this is a very important future question, uh, whether Turkmenistan uh, will be willing to, uh, to encourage more foreign companies to enter its market. Uh, so we did it in, in 2007 uh, with uh, CNPC, the Chinese National Petroleum Company. And also it's a question that if Turkmenistan just theoretically would export 30 BCM towards Europe through uh, the Southern Gas uh, Corridor, then we have to I get there is problem with the capacity because uh, the tunnel pipeline is just 16 BCM capacity at the moment and its continuation, the trans pipeline will be only 10 BCM. Of course, these, might be, these capacities might be upgraded in the future, but when uh, Turkmenistan is uh, is uh, reluctant to uh, export the large amount, like 30 BCM, then this uh, infrastructure, the given infrastructure, is not very uh, feasible for this. So there are uh, a number of factors to consider with regard to the infrastructure capacity, uh, not only in terms of, the, of a potential uh, Trans-Caspian pipeline, but rather about the continuation. And also, very much depends also on Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan has its own reserves and it's practically uh, it's uh, it could be competing or Turkmen gas could be competing to use uh, the southern gas corridor which is in which uh, Sokar, the Azeri uh, national uh, oil and gas company is the majority owner so this raises another question such as how Iran will be uh, participating in the regional energy security processes in the future. At the very moment, it doesn't seem that Iran uh, will be uh, supplying very significant amounts of natural gas to Europe. It might be more interested in to supplying it into the larger uh, energy markets in Asia. But Iran has been also frequently uh, mentioned in the, the European energy uh, security context after uh, lifting the sanctions uh, on the Iran in early uh, 2016. And what I've mentioned just in the beginning, that about the plurality of approaches, if we 
assess this kind of gas, uh, uh, this kind of potential gas relation between uh, Turkmenistan and European Union, uh, a more geopolitical issue or a more uh, economic issue, or, or a more an issue of commercial viability. It's it's rather, I think both are very relevant, and uh, it depends uh, depends on the narrative, but uh, both. Uh, approaches have to be taken into consideration. And just some concluding remarks. Uh, well, what what is important that the EU is aware, uh, fully aware of, of these realities with regard to the Trans-Caspian pipeline projects, uh, with regards to the challenges in terms of capacities, in terms of legal questions, in terms of the uh, consent of other Caspian Sea littoral states. Also, uh, the EU is aware, uh, fully aware about uh, Turkmenistan's um, approach to the question, but still, uh, it is an important element in the European energy security discourse to keep this direction alive and to keep it uh, articulated, uh, especially uh, due to the fact that uh, European energy security could, uh, can be like very uh, much viewed it as in a framework wherein uh, the balances uh, against Russia uh, are sold. Also, uh, as I said, uh, the EU can do a lot on policy coordination level, can do like, strategies. Also, <coughs> the EU Central Asia strategy is in the making. Uh, the new strategy is probably will be out sometimes this year. Uh, but it has to be seen that all the other players have to be uh, considered when it comes to these particular energy relations. So in the past couple of years, I argued that a number of positive developments happened that could uh, uh, make um, that could make um, the, the processes faster, or, or that could create a more uh, positive environment for a new Turkmen uh, gas connectivity. But also, there are some other factors like geopolitical and commercial realities which are rather strongly uh, limiting the chances of feeding the Turkmen gas uh, to the European Union. So basically, it was, I'm sorry it was more than half an hour, but uh, uh, I hope that you will have some uh, comments and feedbacks that will be also very useful for my further research as well, and uh, also if there are uh, in the audience people from uh, Turkmenistan. I would especially uh, encourage you to comment on how you see these issues because, uh, from my point of view, I'm being based in Europe and um, mostly working with, uh, uh, with online uh, sources or databases. It gives a certain narrative about the question. But still, Turkmenistan is far, and not all the uh, realities uh, should be. Uh, I should be aware of, or, or any researcher should be aware of for dealing with this topic. So I, uh, I encourage uh, comments on this topic. And